Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome, Northgate family and anybody else that's going to join us. We welcome you as family. And uh, you are in living rooms probably, some of you by yourself, some of you with family. And we invite you even to stand up right now and, and like step out of spectatorship role into participation role. And uh, worship the Lord Jesus Christ with us together. Just exalt his name and give him the glory and your praise and your worship. And I believe the presence of the Lord is going to fill your homes and uh, fill your rooms if you're in a bedroom. And fill your car if in your car. And hopefully you're not driving in your car. But I'm just inviting the presence of the Lord to come and meet with you wherever you are. Um, before we start, I just want to uh, pray. Um, I want to pray for our governor, just so you know, we're gathered here like this because I had, I was part of a conference call on Friday and where the governor shared his heart for the church to be able to minister in this hour. And he says, I want you to be able to stream, live stream, and even to have bands of, and have uh, gatherings of less, 10 or less, keeping your social distance of six feet. And uh, so we were concerned that we weren't we're not going to be able to do this, but we are. And so let's pray for him. He asked for prayer just so you know about our governor. He has a love for Jesus and, uh, and really is a follower of the Lord. And he says, man, if the church can be praying for wisdom, this is a very hard time uh, for me and all of our uh, legislature. And so we're going to stop. We're going to pray for them and invite the Holy Spirit to meet with us. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of worshiping Jesus Christ in spirit and truth. We come as sons and daughters thanking you that you adopted us into your eternal family and that your affections are toward us. You are with us. You're not far away God, but you're a near God. And we worship you in this truth. We thank you for Governor Dunleavy, who has spoken to the church. We want you to succeed in this hour. We believe that your ministry is essential to the well-being of others. And we pray blessing and wisdom over him and all of those that are making those kind of decisions that you would protect him in his thinking, and he would give divine counsel as he makes decisions regarding the citizens of Alaska. So we bless him today in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord Jesus together. Cause where there was death, you brought life, Lord. And where there was fear, you brought courage. And when I was afraid, you were with me. And you lifted me up. You lifted me up.
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, we just remember, if God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah, and thank you, Lord. You give us peace and joy, but more than that, you give us your presence. You give us you, your presence. We get to walk with you in this moment as more than overcomers. We love you, Lord. I just declare a more than overcomer reality in every home right now. Any place there's been anxiety, we just say more than overcomer. We release the Prince of Peace. We say the Prince of Peace is walking into every room.
out your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry
rise and fall, your throne is stands and long. Your name is unshaken. What helmet to break me has failed. Now nothing will silence my praise. I will cry out.
living rooms and wherever you are, we're going to lift up a shout. We're going to push past any awkwardness because he's worthy. All right, we're going to shout the name of Jesus three times. Well, we are one, two, three. Jesus! Jesus! One more time. Jesus! Yeah, you're good, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. hope without light to the heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
I hope you're having a good time worshiping our Lord like we are here. Um, we just want to come to this place and just agree that God would bring his healing grace to our America, our Alaska, our land. I want to give you just a, a testimony of praise that came through while we were worshiping here. I don't know if you're aware, but we've had a family in our church that's been battling the coronavirus. And uh, the husband and father of that household, John especially, has uh, really been battling uh, not able to breathe, serious headaches, um, really, really uh, lethargic. It's been about 12 days, I believe. Just been battling. As elders, we've been praying for him regularly. But I got this from Rebecca, his wife, this morning. He want, she wanted me to share this with the church um, this morning. She said, John's energy levels have increased. His shortness of breath has decreased. He has a little bit of a headache this morning, but so did I right before the rest of my mild symptoms left. So we're taking that as a good sign. He feels a little pain in his chest every now and then, but this is normal for the healing process. Ever since the elders and you have been praying, there's been a huge change. He's lost a bit of weight, but he's leaning into the Word of God. He's eating fruits and vegetables, believing big time. We know that in the name of the Lord Jesus, he's at the tail end of this thing. Come on. And Satan is defeated. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And so I just want to come into agreement. Thank you, Jesus, huh? Uh, John's doing better, and so many of us have been praying into his healing. But we just come into agreement with some things over Alaska, over this valley. We come into agreement, and we stand against this disease in the name of Jesus, and we declare over this disease to die in the valley, in Alaska, and even over America. We proclaim the blood of Jesus over this disease. It has no authority to continue to steal from us. And so we, we stand in the gap in faith and knowing and believing that God hears our prayers in the name of of Jesus. Amen. So that's such good news. I, I just want to welcome you just to relax a bit. We're going to move into his word. I do thank you for the opportunity just to connect with you, for you guys to connect with uh, the church at Northgate. Uh, we have an opportunity for you to do it through your text. I want to give you a moment just to do that. We're going to put that on the screen here in just a minute. And if you have just a desire to say hello, we can get back to you. Uh, if you have a, a prayer need, we want to be praying for you. Um, if you want to give, which we invite you to continue to give, uh, there's a place for you to give. You can text. And uh, we just want you to take a moment to interact with us. It's a way that we can stay engaged as the body of Christ. So I bless you with peace and provision in Jesus' name. So we'll take that moment now.
All right. Good morning. Welcome you in your living rooms. I have to admit this is a little bit challenging for us, different than doing church normally. And uh, so I just want to make sure that you can relax for a moment with your families as individuals. Um, and uh, I, I'm just grateful for the opportunity of technology that we can gather on stream like this. And whether you're part of the Northgate family or, um, or not, we just bless you. And thank you uh, for the privilege, Lord, of, uh, of being with you. Um, I, I uh, recognize we're in some uh, interesting times, uh, times that we've never actually walked through before. At least my generation uh, has never walked through anything like this before. And uh, our lives have been totally disrupted um, School has been canceled, canceled, some of you as parents, like already, I mean, you're homeschoolers now, and, and that's totally new for you. You didn't sign up for that, uh, but you have to adjust. Uh, everybody's lives is ju- adjusting. Uh, we're out of our norms for sure. And, uh, and so we're just in this place where we're trying to adjust to a new norm, right? Um, entertainment's been taken away from us. Most of our sports has been taken away from us. Uh, The gyms are closed down. Recreation opportunities are not the same. And uh, in the meantime, I believe God is working mightily. I want to just take a time to uh, connect with your heart, especially those of you who are in this place where you've lost income. And some of you have lost jobs. And um, some of you uh, have lost some retirement. Um, other, Other of you have been threatened with your health, and you're in this place where your health is insecure. And, and we're all being shaken right now. And I believe that even though I don't believe the coronavirus um, is, from the, is from heaven, is from the enemy, um, the Lord is going to take this time and use it for our good. Convinced of that. He causes all things to work together for good and to those who love him and called according to his purpose. And so I'm excited about what God's going to do even in the midst of our difficult time. Um, if I can, I just want to pray right now for those of you who have anxiety or in this place where, oh my goodness, I don't really know what's next. You know, none of us do. And, uh, but I know the Lord is here. And uh, we we'll just invite him to speak to us if we can. Father, I, I thank you uh, for every person that's watching. And I declare the love of God over every person, God. Um, you, ha- you are crazy about people, so crazy that you sent your son to die on the cross for them. And I just proclaim the security of your presence and your love and that fear has to go and anxiety has to go and the peace of God invade every heart. And Lord, we have ears right now and we just ask, give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to each one of us because you are a personal God. And you're not far off. You're very near. And you're speaking loudly. One of the things that's interesting to consider or think about um, is this is not just uh, a hard time for America or Alaska, but it's a global time of difficulty. And uh, as I said earlier, people are being shaken. And everything that we have found our security and our hope in, if it's not in eternal things, if it's not in God, it's being shaken right now. Even our Christian liberties for some, like, oh my goodness, like the government is getting so powerful and we're going to lose our Christian liberties. And any time we get shaken, where we lose the peace of God in the midst of challenges, we know that we've put confidence in something that's not from heaven. And so the Lord is actually taking this time, I believe, to refine and align the church up with the voice of God. (laughs) In the midst of the hard stuff, he's refining us and refiring us, the church of Jesus Christ. I believe what the prophets have said, this is a divine reset, a divine reset. And we're to reestablish in our lives our priorities. Consider how we parent again how we do relationships, how we do finances, how we do the church. It's all on the table. And and the Lord is wanting to reconstruct unshakable people, unshakable church in this hour. I'm convinced that God has 
the great things ahead of us. I, I love what the British prime minister said in, during World War II. He said this, he says, you should never let a real crisis go to waste. In other words, there's things that are supposed to happen during these times where we reestablish healthy mindsets um, and actually are able to walk in peace. One of the prophets that has spoken before, and I believe the Lord always prepares the church by releasing prophetic words to the church so when hard times come, we have a word of hope. And we're in this place where we're holding on to the hope of God. And David Wilkerson, who is a pastor in New York City, has since passed away of Times Square Church. He had a vision. And uh, in that vision, this is what he had to say. I see a plague coming on the world, and the bars, churches, and government will shut down. The plague will hit New York City and shake it like it's never been shaken. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles, and repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit, and out of it will come a third great awakening that will sweep America and into the world. This is something that we've been praying for as a church, and many across America has been praying for a great awakening to happen in, in this hour, that there would be a turning back to God. Uh, the church would turn back to God, and America would turn back to God. And this is what I believe this is preparing us for, is a turning back to God, not just for the church, but for the unbelievers and the unbelieving world who are being shaken right now. I got a, a message from one of my brothers, your brother in Northgate. He's been witnessing to his brother for many years. He doesn't know the Lord. Yesterday, he texted me. He said, praise God. My brother accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior today. And, uh, and so he just was so joyful that his brother had turned to the Lord. And I believe that's what's ahead for us, that many people are going to turn to the Lord. I want to stay with this theme that I started two weeks ago, that a frightened world needs a fearless church. And in this hour, the Lord has taken away false securities from us so that we're not afraid. And our, our security and our sense of well-being is not in the things of this world, but actually in the things of the kingdom and the things that are eternal. I want to go to a scripture in John. If you turn your Bibles to John, uh, we'll be in John 16 a bit. I want us just to consider Jesus prepared his disciples for difficult times. Um, in this passage, he's actually talking to them. He's been talking to them about he's leaving um, and he's preparing them for hard times. He wants them to be prepared. And in the same way, he wants us to be prepared for times like this. So in John 16, verse 33, he lands on this place. He says, these things I've spoken to you, so in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Probably not many of us have this verse on our refrigerators. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, the Lord promises us hard times. As long as we live in this world. He says there are going to be hard times. But he's offering us peace and actually wanting us to step into courage in the midst of hard times. So how do we find peace? Yesterday I just Googled for fun to see how the world, how Google and the logarithms come up with peace. I said, how do I find peace? And put it into Google. And uh, it's kind of interesting because immediately they inserted this word inner peace. Because they don't have any clue how to find peace for our earth. And so they're looking to help you find inner peace. And then in that place, they start giving you things you can do. One of them is learn how to breathe and relax. Another one they talk about is meditation. They don't tell you what to meditate on. Hopefully not the news, not a good plan. <laughs> I hope, hope you've discovered that as I have. That is not a good place to meditate. And they actually even tell you how to build boundaries about, around your life so you keep others, even some of yourself, away so you have quiet time or private time. Um, 
But Jesus doesn't say any of these things. He says, these words have I spoken to you that you might find peace in me. It's not in meditation. It's not in learning how to breathe correctly. It's not on building boundaries around yourself. It's found in him. And so he says, these things I've spoken to you. So I just want to take a moment because he's speaking this the night that he's going to be betrayed. It's the night that he ends up being betrayed and taken and scorned and ridiculed and beaten and then ultimately to the cross. And so he's preparing his disciples. He's leaving, right? And so this is like four, five chapters here in the, in the book of John, 13 through 17. And, and since we're going to be celebrating the resurrection next Sunday, I think it would be great if you like got into these words, chapter 13 through 17, because this is how he's preparing his disciple for difficult times. It's been said the most important words a man ever speaks are his dying words. And so these are the words that the Lord speaks. And if we turn to John 13, I'm just going to hit a few of these to highlight. John 13, we find him taking them to the Last Supper, right, where they celebrate the Passover lamb. And uh, he actually is the one who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist said. And here he is with his disciples celebrating the Passover lamb with them. And as they, before they partake of the sacraments, he kneels on the ground, girds himself with a towel, and he washes their feet. And he says, remember this, and as I've done to you, do this to one another. It's crazy to think about the creator of the world. The word was in the beginning, John says. He was with God and he was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory of the only begotten, the Father. That word, that creator, bows his knees and serves his disciples. Do you think he cares about you today? I do. Later on, John 13, he says, I've demonstrated a new way to love. He says, I give you a new commandment. As I have loved you, now you love one another. John 15, later on, he says, greater man has no man love than this. Greater love has no man than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. I want you to receive that love from heaven, and I want you to give that love away. In John 14, he begins that chapter 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Do you think he's speaking that over us today? in Alaska, in America, on this planet. Let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. For in my Father's house are many dwelling places, and I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you will be also. Hey, you all, your friends, my family, Northgate, people who are watching this, our security is not in this earth. It's not in this world. It's in an eternal person and place with God. And this season of shaking is trying to anchor our hearts and our hopes and our dreams in another land. In John 14, a little bit later on, uh, verse 27 He says this, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. There's something that Jesus is preparing his disciples for, and he's going to say, hey, things are going to get rough. But don't get troubled, don't be fearful, because I'm going to be with you. John 14 through 16, he talks about leaving the Holy Spirit, that we're not going to be alone. And, and the Holy Spirit, the comforter, why is he called the comforter? Because we're going to need comfort. He's called the encourager because we need courage. He's called the teacher because we need to be taught the ways of heaven. The Holy Spirit is with us. We're not left alone. And he tells his disciples in John 15 14, and 16 as well. John 15, 9, he says this, Just as the Father 
has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. He's saying, make your home in God's love. Dwell in the love of God. And so we find, we come back to this scripture, John 16, 33. These are some of the words that Jesus spoke to the disciples, said, root your peace in me. His love, the Holy Spirit, heaven, his promises. And we come back to verse 33. I hope you're staying with me. I hope you're doing well. This scripture, just like, I'm so anchored in this scripture. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you might have peace. In the world, you're going to have troubles. There's going to be difficult times. But take courage. Be of good heart. In other places, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In America, I would say most, even believers would say they're not looking forward necessarily to Jesus coming back. It's not what should be. Are you looking forward to Jesus coming back? But the reality is we've had such a good life in America. It's difficult for us to even think that heaven could be that much better. Bible says that heaven is so much greater than anything we'll ever experience on this earth. And, and it's where we're supposed to, like, our hearts are anchored there. We're to live from heaven to earth, to bring that revelation to earth. And in America, we've had it so well. I mean, I have four children who are married to four amazing people. I have 10 grandchildren. I have an amazing wife. I am comfortable. I love Alaska. I love fishing. I love hunting. I get to go to Hawaii now and then. Am I looking forward to Jesus coming back? Actually, I am. I am. Because I know that when I'm with him, I'll be even more fulfilled and joyful. When I see him face to face, I'll be like him. It's going to be a great day. This became real to me, actually. I want to tell you a story. This became very real to me last year when I was in Uganda and I was praying for this woman who came forward and she was hunched over like this and she had tremendous pain in her neck and on her shoulders. And, uh, and as I was talking to her, she appeared to be about 50, but actually was, she was only 37. And definitely she'd had a tough life. And as I talked to her and I was praying for her neck and her shoulders, there, there was some relief. And, uh, and, and then I, I asked her, I said, um, are you married? And she says, yes, I have a husband. I'm one of three wives, and I'm the one that's least liked. My husband is very mean to me. She describes some of it. I won't talk about it here. And her assignment in the household was to put this big jug on her head and to walk a quarter of a mile three times a day to get water for the family. That's one of the reasons why she was so hurting is that she would carry this jug after she walked a quarter of a mile and then walked quarter from the community well back to her house. And, and she was hurting from her assignment, her jobs that she had to do for the household. And, and so as I was talking, I felt the compassion of God for her. And I said, do you know Jesus? And uh, she, big smile. And she said, yes, yes, I know Jesus. And I said, do your husband know Jesus? Because I wanted to talk to her husband. <laughs> and she said, no. No, and neither does his other two wives. And then she said, can you pray for me? That I would know how to love him well and pray for his other two wives that I would be able to show them Jesus. And at that moment, I, like, I'm just like, oh my goodness. This woman is so glad that Jesus overcame the world. And the, the words of Paul, like, is echoing in my mind. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. And there's this transition that even then was happening in my heart. Like, how do I value this temporary world versus eternity and heaven and the reality of his kingdom come, his will be done? And, and everything started, actually was shifting, but really shifted that day. And I'm inviting you to allow this season of shaking 
to realign your heart. I believe this is a time of, of refining in the church. It's a time of repentance, but it's a time of refiring with the power and love of Jesus Christ. I'm going to finish with a story um, that Elizabeth Elliot likes to tell. Her husband, Jim Elliot, is a martyr who gave his life for South American natives. He was a martyr, died, and you, he's got a famous quote. He is no fool, gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And Elizabeth Elliot tells this story of this beggar boy who found out the path of the king for the day. And so he got on the path. The king was going to come by, and he sat down. He got his little, uh, little bowl that people could give donations in next to him. And this beggar boy waited for the king. And sure enough, here came the king. And uh, as the king got to him, he was totally shocked by the king's response. The king leaned over and said to the beggar boy, so what will you give to the king? Taken back, the little beggar boy reached into his pocket, was filled with rice, and he pulled out three grains of rice. And in his mind, as he's handing the rice to the king, he's asking the question, what, what in the world would a king ask a beggar boy for? And he gave him three grains of rice. And the king bent down and in the, in the vessel, in the uh, plate, dropped three coins, gold coins. And the little beggar boy thought, wow, what would have happened if I would emptied my whole pocket and give him everything I had? This is the invitation of trusting in Jesus Christ. This is what it means to be born again and becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and to the church, I just want to say this. This is the time when this scripture becomes very real. That those who follow me must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow after me. And he who seeks to find his life will lose it. But he who will lose his life for my sake will find life and find it abundantly. This is the season we're in. I just want to speak to the church. This is a time to refine, reestablish your priorities. Make Jesus your number one priority. The word of God and his presence. Become the light of the world. Become the bold witness that God's called you to become. Become the ones that love your neighbors, even laying down your life for their well-being. Become those kind of people. If you're not, a follower of Jesus Christ, I ask you, make that decision today. Make that decision. He is your hope. He loves you. He laid down his life for you on the cross. He paid the price for all the things you've ever done wrong, so you have a right relationship with the Father. He loves you with a love that's indescribable, unfathomable. And I discovered that love when I was 21. It changed my life forever. And I want to invite you into the journey of finding the truth about Jesus Christ. There's a book that I have that I'd love to give to you. My email is dennis at northgatealaska.com. Dennis, with two N's, northgatealaska.com. If you will email me and say, I would like to read that book. This book demonstrates that there is evidence to believe that Jesus Christ rose on the third day. And because he rose on the third day, everything he said is true. And you will find him to be faithful, even in difficult times. So we're going to take communion together. We're going to um, just celebrate what he did for us on the cross and invite the victory of the cross over our lives and uh, over our nation, over our state. So we bless you. And uh, Jason and Mariah will come and lead you in communion as a family and as individuals. Good. Awesome. If you've got a Bible, if you have a Bible, you've got a Bible, I'm going to read a couple of verses out of Colossians 2 that I believe are what the Lord put on my heart and put on our heart for, for communion today. And 
we're going to quickly build this, but actually realize there's a personal application with taking communion and what the finished work of the cross has done for us, and then a corporate application for us as the body of Christ in the church and the earth. So I'm going to start Colossians 2, verse 9. For he is the complete fullness of deity living in human form, and our own completeness is now found in him. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. He is the head of every kingdom and every authority in the universe. I love that. Through our union with him, we have experienced circumcision of heart. And all the guilt and power of sin has been cut away and is now extinct because of what Christ the Anointed One has accomplished for us. For we've been buried with him into his death. Our baptism into death also means that we were raised with him when we believed in God's resurrection power, the power that raised him from death's realm. This realm of death describes our former state, for we were held in sin's grasp. But now we've been, tr we've been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return, for we are forever alive and forgiven of all of our sins. He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record, and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all, and they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Take that today in faith as a, for us personally as a finished work of the cross as we realize that we're coming into union. We've already come into union with Christ. So here's where it starts to pivot corporate application. Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, including coronavirus, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led, Jesus led them around as prisoners in procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. I love that. Another translation of this is basically Jesus shed his physical body and now he multiplies himself through us, his body, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, fivefold, and enforces the triumph of the cross to all the thrones and authorities, putting, to, uh, putting all of them to public shame by the manifestation of himself through us who believe. How about that? I love that. So I want to just take a second and pause. I believe this is as we build ourselves in the finished work of the cross. That coronavirus, right, Psalm 91, is not allowed to enter our bodies. And then therefore, as the body of Christ and the church in the earth, we enforce the finished work of the cross into the earth and say coronavirus and every other form of sickness while we're at it has to bow to the name of Jesus. Amen. So what Jason is talking about is the reality in which you and I are able to live in. And this is available to us through the cross. And we cannot live in the reality of the kingdom with unbelief ruling our heart and mind. And what I felt led to do was to call us into repentance for any place of unbelief in our lives. We are in a very unique season. And we must ask, what is it that God is saying? And so right now, just in your living rooms, wherever you are, would you just close your eyes? And I'm, I just want to lead us into a prayer of repentance because I just, I really believe that we're like in this moment as the body of Christ, like there's so many things that can distract us even now, but God is really clear about wanting us in order for our, our land to be healed and for us to be restored, there has to be repentance. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we repent and come out of agreement with any place of fear and unbelief idolatry and apathy, distraction and discouragement, pride and stubbornness, rebellion and resistance. God, we return to you and we recognize what day we are in. We humble ourselves and we wrap our lives around you. We call our families and our state into repentance unto believing. Thank you for the power of the cross. Thank you for your body broken for us. Thank you, Jesus. So in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord God. We want to know you in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. And with thanksgiving, Jesus, right now, we partake.
Jesus, I thank you for your blood. I thank you that not one drop was lost or wasted. I thank you for the finished work of the cross. I thank you for your blood that forgives all my sin and the sin of my nation and the nations. I thank you for the thoroughness of your blood and that nothing is stronger than your blood and your broken body for us. I thank you that the life of Christ, your life for our life, your life is in the blood. And I thank you, Jesus, that forgiveness and healing, wholeness are in your blood. So today, Jesus, I'm asking that you wash our families, our communities, our city, our state, our nation and the nations in your blood. Wash us clean, free from all sin, wickedness, unrighteousness. And with it, I'm asking that you take this coronavirus and fear with it. Your word says that you made a public spectacle of sin, sickness, and death and nailed it on the cross by the power of your blood. And we thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that we can be a people of wild hope, wild hope, that all unbelief, we're free from all forms of unbelief so that wild hope can run free because of your blood. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we're going to go back into worship for a couple minutes. I invite you right, to stay with gonna, us. We're going to sing this song. It's called Heal Our Land. And it's a few years old, but it's everything we're talking about today. That was such a good word, Dad. And um, this song is called Heal Our Land. Uh, before this year started, November, December, I really felt like this song was a prophetic song over this next season, which we're in now. Um, and um, it's just the grace of God to give us a song and to get our hearts ready for the moment we're in. We've been talking as a family about coming just to Jesus, stripping everything away. He set us up for this moment. And um, so we're going to sing this prayer, Heal Our Land. And it's just out of that scripture. Um, Yeah. All right, we're going to sing the song. You take our lives, flawed, you're beautiful. Restore, refine, Lord, you merciful redeem revive spirit of God breathe on your church pour out your presence speak through your word we pray in every Christ be known, our hope and salvation, Christ alone, new power, new wine, as divisions fall. Church, pour out your presence, speak through your word. We pray in every nation, Christ we know, our hope and salvation, Christ alone, new power. 
power New wine Oh, as divisions fall Let's sing this out, one church One church One variety Oh, Jesus, Lord of all With one voice With one voice, we cry, oh Spirit of God, breathe on your church and pour out your presence and speak through your word. We pray in every nation. you to go ahead and stand in your living rooms and uh, if you would wherever you are uh, put your hand on your heart right now and let's just come into agreement with this prayer right now that the Lord Jesus Christ would be known like never before through your life through my life through the church there would be a healing work of heaven that would come invade America invade Alaska invade this valley invade this planet Our Lord is a healer. He's a restorer. He reestablishes health. And his kingdom come, his will be done. And so, Lord, we surrender our hearts to you, our goals, our ambitions, our desires, and we align ourselves with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the God of peace. You are the God of joy. You are the God of victory. And we thank you for the victory you've won for all of us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Our trust, our trust, our trust is in you. 
and you alone. We bless you, Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. I'm going to pray this prayer over you real quickly. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound with hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Be blessed today. Have a great week. Stay connected. Bless one another. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you know who you can encourage. We're going to stay connected as the body of Christ. You are loved. Amen. See you later. Bye.